Welcome to our first ever virtual event for Wines of Germany USA. Um, today's event, Germany's Reasoning Revolution, is the first in a five-part series that y'all would have been invited to called German WFH, Wine from Home. Um, you know, this year's obviously a little bit different than in years past. You know, we love our in-person uh, media and trade events, whether it be in New York, LA, or elsewhere. Um, but we were excited to bring um, a lot of our event programming to you virtually and um, have some new faces on here and reach people all across the country. Um, my name is Steven Schmitz. I am one of the directors of the Wines of Germany campaign here in the US. You would have gotten many emails um, from me about today's events and we are really excited to have you. Um, to kick off our five part series, we had to start with Riesling, Germany's iconic grape. Um, and what? who better um, to bring you Riesling than three incredible young producers um, that I'm gonna let our host, um, Master Sommelier, Laura Williamson, introduce for you. A little bit about Laura before we get started here today. Um, so Laura, as I mentioned, a master psalm. There are few Americans um, more steeped in German wine than Laura. Um, Laura managed um, the sales promotions in the US for two of the country's top uh, importers of German wines, Rudy Wiest and Terry Thies in, in former lives. Um, also worked um, at some of the premier food and beverage destinations in New York and elsewhere. And we're so thrilled uh, to have her here. We're gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura in just a moment, but a couple housekeeping items before I do. One, if you're interested in, in tagging any of us, um, the Wines of Germany USA social info is all at German Wine USA, not at Wines of Germany. Um, unfortunately, the British beat us to that. And so uh, we're, uh, we have that handle, um, but we're really excited today. Um, we're gonna have Laura host um, a discussion with our three winemakers we encourage you to taste alongside um, us today. And then as far as comments, questions, if you, if you want to express any sort of opinions or thoughts on the subject at hand, we encourage you to do that in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. If you have a specific Q&A, that we'd encourage you to add to the Q&A section. We will have a team member monitoring chat. So if you forget, it's not a big deal, um, but we do encourage you to put those Q and A's in the Q and A function and we'll bring everyone in at the end and uh, get make sure that all those were, were answered. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. And again, um, thank you all for joining us for today's events. Thank you, Stephen. It's great to be here. It's always a beautiful day to start when we get to enjoy Riesling. So I'm on the West Coast in California and I said Riesling breakfast of champions. Couldn't be more delighted. So the fun part about today is to discuss Riesling Germany, where it is and where the future is, where it's going. We have three extraordinarily talented young winemakers with us and they are part of Generation Riesling. This is a group that is 35 and under and really highlighted as taking over in many cases for their family and working on the operations. But we do have a few different backgrounds and perspectives. So we're gonna just kind of dive into that right away. And first up, Katarina, Katarina Fadung of Allendorf Family Winery. And the unique aspect about Katarina is that she's really not part of the true proper family. We call her adopted by the Allendorf family. So it's a very unique pivot and story, but it also links into her business degrees, her studies, and a little bit of history of that. So Katerina, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Um, great to have you. We're gonna let Thanks you talk. For having me. Thank you. We're gonna let you start talking about how you tied into the Allendor family and then your business degrees what this led to and what you're doing, because it's such a unique twist here for this younger generation that you're part of. Yeah, thank you. Well, as you already mentioned, I have to admit that I'm not a real family member, um, but I know the family Allendorf for a long time because I grew up in the same village as they, their estate is located. And um, in 2009, I became the wine queen of my hometown 
Winkel. And um, since I'm not from a winery, um, I needed kind of a partnership to, to a winery. And um, the family Allendorf said, hey, let's do it. Um, we're going to support you. And um, so they, they pushed me through a long time as a wine queen. Um, and then I became the Ranga wine queen and at last the German wine princess. And through all these years, the Allendorf family supported me. And so we yeah, got really close. And um, yeah, when I finished uh, my studies of international wine business in Geisenheim, uh, it was just clear that I'm going to work for the family Allendorf and support them and give some of their support back to them. Fantastic. I think it's just a unique twist because a lot of times we think of the younger generation already established in the family. So you were really quite interested and pushed yourself to become involved. So I think while we segue into our next little chat here, um, which we're gonna talk about this incredible wine that you have, um, would you like to introduce the wine and kind of guide us through a quick little taste, the profile, and of course, linking in the style of the label and what your quest is here? Sure. Um, let me just pull some wine in. Um, well, I think it's important to show the label at first or talk about the label um, because that's the main point about this wine. Um, it's just eye-catching, it's, it's uncomplicated, um, it's easy, and that's exactly what the wine is supposed to be. Uncomplicated, easy drinking, um, and yeah, just, just uh, supposed to make fun. Um, I believe that a lot of people are kind of scared of the subject wine, that they're scared not knowing about uh, uh, much about it, and then they can't drink it. But that's actually total nonsense because you don't have to know anything about wine to just drink it and enjoy it. And that's what our label says and what the wine says. Just enjoy it. Just let it be uncomplicated and just let it be Riesling. You don't have to drink. Uh, you don't have to make it too complicated. Um, I mean, if you if you think of a very traditional um, label of German wine, it's so much information on the label. Yeah, that I can totally imagine that some some people think this is way too much for me. I can't drink it, and that's something. I think it's great taking the intimidation out of it. And now we have the dry version here, but you do have different ones. <clears throat> I noticed too, you have a non-alcoholic. Tell yeah. us about the success of all this, because I think it's been quite successful if, if I'm just guessing. Totally, yeah, you're right. Um, we founded this brand um, 10 years ago. So 2011 was the first vintage we did it. And it was so successful that we also made a fruity one. Um, so kind of semi-dry. Um, we have a non-alcoholic um, and we have an um, alcohol reduced one and a juice. So four different types. And um, brand new is our Schorle. So you know Germans love to drink Schorle. So we made small Schorle bottles as well. And all, all kind of wines and um, bottles are very successful, especially in retail shops. Great. Well, um, do we have any questions here that we need to tackle? It, uh, we see a note that the alcohol-free is available in the US as well. Yeah. <clears throat> any other questions here? We're gonna continue to move forward. We'll, we'll circle back several times, but are we missing any questions? I think that is a no. So, I think well, someone is asking how we eliminate the alcohol. So it's a vacuum distillation. So you know, produce a normal wine. We use the normal dry wine as we taste it now. And then uh, we um, put the alcohol out to a vacuum distillation. What I love about this is that the dry style, it's so user friendly too. It's just um, supple. There's juiciness to it. It is inviting, easy. I don't want to call it a porch pounder, but it definitely is in that dangerous territory, which is not a bad thing if it's refreshing and solves the purpose. 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's the style, that's what the wine tells, and um, it has to be uncomplicated, even though it's a really handcrafted wine. It's just so drinky, you want to take a, next, a second sip and take Drink a second glass. That was your mission. Wonderful. Well, I think we will move to Sophie Christman of A. Christman in the Faults, and Katarina will be back with you shortly. So... I'd love to introduce Sophie as the ninth generation now of the Christman family. Um, it's quite a success. And some of you may recognize that last name as her father is the head of the VDP. So he's had a very intense role and I'm sure some of that pulls into Sophie's domain a little bit, whether she knows it. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's been quite a bit of business shift especially in these current times that we're in right now. So Sophie, you had mentioned to me when we spoke that a lot of this has kind of had you think about this as the next generation, but what this means in terms of your strategy. So tell us a little bit about what has gone on with your travel and market work and how this is kind of shifting your platform at home and your, your goal and vision for the winery. In general, in um, March, when we suddenly had to cancel all events and stop traveling, um, we, yeah, it, I think it made everyone think, but it made us think especially about where we'd want to be in the, in the next years. And um, like at the beginning, we were actually quite happy about um, not traveling so much anymore because I think many of us winemakers had been um, traveling way too much in the last years and um, it's something like I, I love to meet people but I prefer to be in the vineyards so um, it's uh, something that has uh, rooted us a bit more and um, in this time we've been thinking about our long-term strategy and we've decided that we want to um, like many wineries are getting bigger and bigger and if you get bigger you'll only be the manager of a big estate and it won't yeah it won't be such an important thing anymore what you're growing or what you're producing um, but we want to stay wine growers and so we are aiming to um yeah to decrease the amount of vineyards that we work with a little bit and also the amount of wines because we want to be able to work with our philosophy in every part and that's something where you cannot be too big in our opinion. Fascinating. I really think it's unique and you also mentioned, um, well before we go further let's have everyone start to taste your wine and then I have a few more little tidbits to bring in here but would you like to introduce this wine? Yes, of course. So the 2018 Pfalz Riesling is for us like our business card. Like it might not be the most inexpensive estate Riesling, um, but it's a wine that perfectly shows our philosophy. Like we only want to produce high quality. So it's 100% own grapes that we grow in a biodynamic way in our vineyards. It's 100% handpicked. It's 100% fermented spontaneously in um, stainless steel and wooden, tank, uh, wooden barrels. And um, so it's already pretty, pretty high quality for like a basic Riesling. And um, yeah, that's why we've also been thinking about like um, increasing the quality level in general. Fantastic. And I also thought it was a unique twist that even in the midst of the volume of let's say other grapes like Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc, those are expanding at 100 plus percent growth, but you are actually taking those out and planting more Riesling. Yeah, like we, we believe that it's that you make the best products from the things that you love the most. And for us, that's of course Riesling because it's it belongs here, like it's in our blood. That's what we grew up with. Um, but for me, it's also Pinot Noir, and that's something that we are also increasing a little bit. But I don't want to grow any varieties that I don't like drinking. Like, I think that's something other people can do if they like it. I think that's wonderful. Great mission. If you're going to make it, you have to be able to enjoy it and have the passion behind it. So that's fantastic. Um, do we have any questions about this wine? Um, you can feel that it is a little bit more tight and nervous, even in its dry style. 
Um, you had mentioned that the residual sugar was around 2.5 grams per liter. Is that right on this wine? Yes, like in 2018 was a bit warmer vintage. So um, like in general, we're aiming for a very dry, not a like we don't aim for a fruity style, like we want our wines to be rather salty and herby. And um, that's something that you can taste in this wine already pretty good, I think. Yes, it is very salty and umami driven. It's, it's a serious endeavor. Fantastic. Now, do we have any questions? Am I missing any questions? Let's look here. Um, I see a question here about any favorite food pairings for the dry Riesling. Um, I think we can have you touch on that for a quick second if you want. What what you would envision to pair this with? Like since I grew up in a Riesling family, we drink Riesling basically with anything, I must admit. Um, depending if it's like younger or older, it goes with lighter or heavier dishes. But in general, I'd, I'd like to have it, like I have it by its own without food or with uh, lighter things like, um, like salads or fresh seafood and things like that. And if you have heavier meals, you have to have a Riesling that is a little bit more um, aged, I think. Fantastic, wonderful. Well, thank you, Sophie. And we will return in just a moment. Let's bring Philip in right now. Philip Kettern of Lothar Kettern, um, we welcome you from the Mosul. So we've touched on the Rheingau, the Falls, and now the Mosul. And hello, hello. It's good to have you. Good to welcome. Today. And you, um, you took over in 2008. There's so much to talk about here, but uh, just a note for everyone to realize that he's still in um, harvest, right? You still have a little bit to do. You've been working crazy over the last week and you still have some left. Um, we left, uh, we done the last week at uh, 20 minutes ago. So uh, after the Zoom meeting, we uh, I have to press the last grapes for this year. Fantastic. So that was just a, a quick segue into letting everyone know that you are graciously <laughs> joining us in the midst of the craziness. So I just um, really want to touch on here that I think that what you're doing right now is quite interesting, especially for the Mosul and being situated in Peaceport and this middle zone here where we know has such historical roots. You are definitely pressing the envelope with this and you took over in 2008. We have a Predicat style wine here for you, but you have two brands at the winery that you work with and represent taking over for your family and the new brand that you started. So tell us a little bit first about the two brands and then we're gonna dive into the roots, the source of the reasoning for this kind of revelation for you. So um, I took over, so I, I'm, I'm, com I'm coming back to the Mosul 2008 and uh, took over the winery from my parents uh, 2011 the winery, um, Lothar Kettern, where we're producing really, really classical Mosul wines uh, in, a, in a total predicate system. Um, we really focusing on uh, more sweeter style wines. We have uh, two more drier wines, but uh, we are really focusing on Cabinet, Edlese, Auslese, and uh, the noble sweet wines. And then uh, I, uh, we uh, founded 2016 the, the new project or it, it's, it's starting with a project or an idea and it's uh, getting serious uh, 2016 FIO. FIO uh, it's a winery with Nieport from Portugal together um, where we doing wines um, like let, let's say 100 years ago, um, the, the idea is that we aging wines over over year in the on the yeast, bottling normally unfiltrated um, with low or nothing on sulf uh, adding sulfur. So it's, it's 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 a kind of style which is not really normal at the Mosul. 
It is very unique. And I think this is an incredible way to kind of preface it, that this is the forward movement, that there you are um, a renegade, but there are others that are looking at this too in an area where we didn't expect a lot of this to surface. And so yeah, you, you, when, you, when you're thinking on, on, on the Mosul, you have a directly idea um, which which uh, which style is Mosul and which is the classic and um, we we had the, the chance to drink or to taste uh, a lot of old Mosul wines and when you go history looking um, that is pretty normal that you aging a wine 18 or 24 months on the yeast um, without sulfur that was like 1920 1910 pretty normal in that in that time um, the to harmonizing the the bar the wine to getting in balance to getting the finest elegance and today everybody is talking about classic mosul style the wines getting faster and faster produced uh, getting faster and faster on the market um, when a when a wine tastes not in that moment where the consumer is tasting it, uh, it's not pretty nice. The people say, oh, it's in the moment in a, in a hole or it's, in a, it's a bad situation to taste. The, the, I think that the best way is to boil a wine when the wine is ready, which we, which we learned from a really, really uh, good uh, Dura producer, which, uh, who is producing wines uh, also long aging on a yeast and uh, he's bottling the wines when he say okay that the wine is now ready it's in balance it's in harmony and then it's coming in a bottle and uh, on the market fantastic and i know before your jura trip you you had a segue into the duro valley where uh, derek newport taught you a little bit about how to assess your vineyards in the mosul in addition to, you know, linked with the way he assessed it in the Douro with this movement for dry back, you know, early 80s in the Douro Valley. Tell us a little bit about what you learned from that trip and how that carries over with your style today. It was in the beginning of the total, you have to know, it, uh, the Mosul had a lot, lot um, not that extremely ripe years in the 1980s. And then coming the 2000s, and uh, the vintage getting warmer and warmer. The, the top was 2003, and the Mosul starting to producing really rich, ripe wines, um, really powerful wines, um, which are for a taste uh, really impressive. But um, the Mosul in that time, not all, everybody, but a lot of winners losing losing the philosophy and uh, the the idea of a Mosul wine because Mosul wine have to be really elegant, really fresh, really light, and that and and, and then that years uh, the wines getting a lot of uh, alcohol, a lot of sugar, the acidity goes really low. The wines was was not really that that making you nervous and um i i poured dirk a lot of that wine because my father is doing that was totally in that uh, in that time making uh, that style of wine and uh, i pouring dirk um a lot of our wines and um after after one week tasting my wines he said oh philip I like you really much, but uh, when you like to learn more about your region, you have to visit me in Portugal. And after after one week, I get that uh, uh, ticket from him one way to Portugal, and I flew to him. And which uh, what we what he learned me is why why the hmm, all every. Everywhere in the world, um, when you see the big brands, I have not to say which, uh, who the names, um, but 
all the, the big names are light, fresh, and elegant, or are they coming from that stuff? When you drink old uh, Italian Tuscany, there was fresh, there was elegant, there was power, there was lightful and really drinky. Today they're getting a bit richer, and also Burgundy and also uh, Bordeaux. When you had a, have an old Bordeaux, they having like 11.5, maybe 12. Not like today, a bit more. And so I think this is amazing that this this return to history, even though you're the new generation, this push to this return to history brought you back to this style. So I just wanted to push that a little so that everyone's tasting your wine and realizing how ethereal and delicate and well-crafted it is. Wonderful. So now let's um, actually touch on a quick topic here about the farming. And Katerina, I'd love to come back to you real quick because you have under your helm a pretty large property in the sense of it's 70 hectares. And you're not certified, but you are moving towards um, very sustainable practices. So definitely farming sustainably, you've got the bee friendly certification. Um, tell us a little bit about that bee friendly certification. Well, first of all, you might have guessed that I'm not the only young person in our estate. So I'm kind of the new generation that takes over the estate now. And since um, Max, the son of the owner is um, in charge for the production, the whole quality thinking and aiming changed and as well um, as the sustainability. And yeah, we're making our own honey because we have this bee friendly greening, but I guess Sophie, you have the same greening with all these nice flowers in, in the middle of the rows. And we're making our own honey out of it. And also he bought around 25 sheep the smallest sheep race in the world that kind of cares around one hectare of our vineyards and they do a lot of the greening stuff and also a little canopy management. So yeah, Thanks. we're trying to work very close to the nature and a long-term aim is of course a biological certification, but um, talking about 70 hectares, it needs some time to change it that way. That's fantastic. I love to see that focus and just touching on any aspect that can enhance the property in general. And I know, uh, Sophie, you are farming biodynamically. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what you're doing here, the growers, how they're all working together in the faults, which is really kind of an anomaly. We don't see that so often as this, this community group oriented link. Yeah, like my, my father already converted the winery to organic and biodynamic farming in 2002. Um, and he also did it together with um, close friends from um, Birklin Wolf, Repolz and Wittmann. Um, at the beginning, mostly because like they wanted to bring back the, um, the terroir Riesling that really tells the story of um, the place where it's grown. And they thought that um, they only could like show the terroir really good if the wines are in balance with their surroundings. And um, after now more than 15 years, um, for us, it got even more important than kind of only being the way to put the terroir in the bottle. Um, now it's more about um, responsibility for our soils, because like those soils have been the, like what my family, like they are the value of the winery. Um, and so we have to keep them healthy. And um, that's what we're investing in a lot. And the beautiful thing is that there are many like young wine growers um, also changing to organic and biodynamic farming. Like for example, what I told you about is like um, last week when we prepared the 500, like one of the um, preparations that we use, um, we were like, I think like 15 young wine growers from different wineries um, sipping beer and um, <laughs> doing the preparations. So it's amazing to have, because it's something that you have to talk about, like you have to learn from others because even after 15 years, there are new things that we can learn. There are things that we can do better. And that's something where it's great that you always have people that you can meet and talk to and that we can also share things with. And that's amazing. Fantastic. Thank you for explaining that. It is quite unique. And then 
Philip, I know that you're actually not certified, but you're organic and you're working towards biodynamics in another five years. And you have kind of learned from some of the mentors in Alto Adige that you have to create your own system that works for you in your location. And I know that that's meant um, kind of zero travel, being with the vineyards, inside the vineyard all the time to understand the full process. Tell us what you'd like to share about what you're learning. I think it's not, uh, uh, I think uh, Sophie knows that, that uh, you cannot copy and paste uh, biodynamic in everywhere in the world where you are. Um, you have to, uh, in the Pfalz region, it's, you have more the flat vineyards and the Mosul, you have more the steep vineyards and the Doro Valley, you have this, the, the, the terraces where totally different climate in all three different regions. And um, you have to find your way how, how you can work and handle your vineyards. Um, um, we had at Nieport um, uh, three years uh, uh, biodynamic consultant, Andrew Laurent, who is dying too, too, uh, too early. And uh, he is always uh, telling you that you have to find your way where you're feeling comfortable with um, and also um, the economic thing have to uh, play inside. Um, and that uh, we are finding in the moment out uh, how we can handle it in the vineyard that we not sitting on, uh, on, on the machines too much and uh, feeling good with it uh, to doing biodynamic in the future. Great, thank you. I think very critical for many to hear that. Now, just talking quickly about climate change, we could have a whole seminar on that. But Katarina, you mentioned that one of the major problems in the Rheingau is drought and no one would really suspect that. Tell us a little bit about how you're combating that, what you're dealing with. Yeah, well, climate change is definitely uh, influencing the winemaking, um, but the biggest problem is not the heat itself, but that it's not raining during summertime. Um, so the drought is really the problem. Um, and you can definitely see that on the grapes. So um, during harvest, when we've been to Rüdesheim, so where the, the vineyard sites get really steep and you also have this stony soil so that the grapes have a hard time to get down to the groundwater. Um, you can definitely tell that they didn't have enough water and the drought was really the problem. And what we did was bringing water in the vineyards um, and also uh, the new vineyards we planted, we just planted, we also put um, a watering inside that works kind of automatically so you don't have to bring the water anymore. Um, yeah, and as you, as you already mentioned, it's the biggest problem. You can really see the, the berries are small and shrimpled and not, not rich and juicy anymore. I bet that's a surprise for many on this, um, on this webinar right now. Thank you. And Sophie, I know your quest is kind of to really perfect that balance, making sure you are mitigating over ripeness, especially in the faults where you're further south and you have the sun and the warmth. So tell us a little bit about how you're managing this. Um, you've mentioned the soil before too, so. Yeah, it's been like for us, it's a big process because like if, if I listen to my grandfather, he always said you couldn't pick good grapes in September, you'd always have to wait until October for perfectly ripe grapes. And that's something that he was really proud of. And he's, um, he just turned 91. So he was still part of this year's harvest team. Um, but we finished picking already on September 18th. So we already started in August. Um, so it like it like we are picking about four weeks earlier now than we did um, like 20 years ago. Um, and we also have to be way quicker because since it's so much earlier, it's warmer. And um, the biggest danger that we see is overripeness. Like no one likes a brown banana, um, but that's something that we really, that we get like really easy with our grapes now. Like if you wait too long, they turn brownish and then you don't get this like slim, elegant and focused taste anymore that we have on our estate Riesling. And that's why we have um, increased the, the speed of picking a lot. 
And um, the problem that um, Katharina mentioned, like the drought is also a problem here. And that's something where biodynamics kicks in for us again, because um, like we've been working with greenings and compost a lot, and this increases the um, nutrition and the, I don't know if you call it hummus in English too. Yes, the hummus, the hummus of the soil. And, um, it's something that um, you increase a lot and this stores the water in the soils. Um, but as Philip mentioned too, that's something that is way easier for us here in Pfalz because our vineyards are flat, like we can drive through them with the tractor. And so um, it's easier for us to manage those um, things, but it's um, been helping a lot. Fantastic. So Philip, I'm going to let you tell everyone kind of how your growing season, even in the Mosul, has changed that, that reduction in, in season of harvest and when you start that kind of process, how fast it's gotten to for the Mosul, not just Faltz or Rheingau, but also how the Mosul is impacted. <clears throat> yes, as, uh, as Sophie said, um, uh, when I starting uh, in the winery, um, it was normal that we starting at the middle, the beginning of the October, middle of October and going, so, still to the to the middle of November harvesting that that is totally changing um, the last the last five six years we starting like in September mostly the time around the 15th of September um, because of but but it's just um, our strategy uh, it's not for everybody um, because we 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 really focusing of that on a lighter, fresher style with a high acidity and a low in alcohol. Um, and that is, that is not really possible when you're starting really late. Uh, we normally, yeah, the most of our wines are without botrytis, uh, just, the, just the noble sweet wines, uh, they having botrytis. Um, and when you like to get healthy grapes uh, with, with that, with that um, profile, which which I tell you is, you have to harvesting more and more earlier, and that can be a big problem. You, everybody said that the Mosul has that long, cool ripeness time. It's getting shorter and shorter uh, in the moment. Um, that's the reason why we go where we get uh, in the we starting six years ago now going in neighbor sites uh, when yet we're having a lot of in the, in the in our main mountain like the peace water gold but uh, you see more and more that the, that the neighbor side when getting more and more important for us because then you can go now we have the 14 of October moving after three weeks uh, of the, our main mountain to the neighbor side mountain and getting the same which we get three weeks before uh, which is really important for us uh, and getting it's a important point in our winery today. And you're because during you can, as, you can, as Sophie said, the, 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 the harvesting going shorter and shorter. Um, you have to you have to harvest faster and faster, but you cannot get every grapes in one week inside, maybe with a hundred manpower team. But in that in the in the situation we are now, it's really perfect and we have we can harvesting from the Grand Cru to the Premier Cru and then to the neighbor side villages, which is which relaxed the system pretty good. Fantastic. And I know you mentioned it's kind of moved from a six week span of harvest to three and a half weeks now is what you usually achieve that in. So we're just gonna touch on terroir versus ripeness because we have historically associated Germany with this push for ripeness and this accumulation of that ability to transfer into power and weight of style for this normally cool climate, which we just hear is changing. Katarina, tell us how this change of kind of your terroir has translated to this more ethereal, delicate style, um, this ability for your consumers, as you mentioned to me, to be able to enjoy the wine and maybe more than one glass. 
yeah, I think that's the way we have to go or what, what we have to concentrate on because it's um, for Germany as a wine growing country a unique selling point that we are able to produce light alcohol levels um, but still have a have a great wine that shows its um, origin um, and its, its terroir and um, yeah, we have a global trend that asks for light alcohol levels um, and we are the, the wine growing country that can produce those. So for us as the winery Allendorf, but I guess for a lot of other winemakers as well, it's very important to concentrate on uh, early harvest, um, just as Sophie already said, not, not becoming overripe, um, because uh, both is possible, ripe but not overripe grapes that show the terroir. So yeah, that's what we focus on. Um, also, of course, a, a clear and drinky style, um, but um, in, I guess, over 50%, we also use wooden barrels, spontaneous fermentation, but um, try to focus on light alcohol level and keeping it drinky because for us as winemakers and for you as wine sellers, it's important that your customer says, I take a second glass. If you think about a, a white wine with, I don't know, 14 and a half, volume percent, it's kind of filling. You think it's nice and it's, it's drinkable and it fits probably to your food, but after it, you don't want to have a second glass because we're already filled. And you have, if you have one of those German Rieslings having only 11 and a half point alcohol, just as Sophie says, you can have a second glass and that's our aim as winemakers and it should be yours as well. Fantastic. And that's a great segue to Sophie too. Um, just touch on a little bit about how you are using terroir and expanding your GGs and maybe considering um, putting that focus there, balanced ripeness, but how is that playing into your, your overall work and expansion? Like in general, I think we are a family with very strong opinions about what we want to do and what we don't want to do. Um, and we want to produce the best quality that we can get. And that's something that already my grandfather has invested on. So we have like really good vineyard quality and 95% of our vineyards are classified Erste and Große Lage according to the VDP system. Um, but of course, we don't only produce Erste and Große Lage. Um, so also the estate Riesling is made um, like a lot of like really good vineyards. And um, we've seen that in the past years um, to achieve the quality that we want, it's very um, labor intense. There's lots of, there are many things that we have to do with hand. Um, and there are also many things that we have like invested a lot of money in, like for example, those cover crops and everything. And um, so we want to, get a little bit smaller quant quantity wise um, to improve the quality in general even more. And um, because we find that if the winery is um, too big, you cannot focus on the best quality and on the, the single vineyards. And um, so we are thinking about um, decreasing the amount of estate Riesling um, because we have so many great individual vineyards like the GG vineyard that are classified Große Lage. Um, there are so many unique terroirs that we want to bring into the bottle um, that we yeah, really want to focus on those. Fantastic. Now, Philip, um, you kind of mentioned to me your quest for this style of cabinet. Um, it would really be roughly 7.5% alcohol and 30 grams per liter residual sugar. That's, that's kind of your aim. And I mentioned to you that that really for a lot of producers would be a little bit more like fine herb. But this is, again, your preference of style and this terroir over the push just for sheer ripeness. Tell us a little bit about this. Yes, um, we, we, we see ca cabinet now not as a, as a predicate or the most people say, oh, cabinet is the, normally the, the lowest price category in the sweet wine predicate system. Um, we we see more cabinet as a as a as a person and also as a as a concrete in our vineyards. For us, is the the 
in our winery is the cabinet um, like the like the GG in the VDP for, uh, because the the cabinet is the most unique wine which you can produce in in the Mosul because there's so much things inside it's 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 fresh it's light it's elegant it's a bit of sugar it's acidity which make you um which which plays really good with the with the sugar so the wine tastes in the end really really dry but also the cabinet it's um it's, um, it's getting more and more difficult to produce it in the uh, today and also in the last years or in the future uh, when you when you're searching for like our style of making cabinet it's it's no problem to make a cabinet um, richer and riper but you, then you lose the idea from our uh, from our history from the Mosul for a cabinet the cabinet have to be in light and not too much because the the cabinet was a wine which our which my grandfather taking in the vineyard with in the summer um which which uh, which uh, things have to be right cabinet have to be have to have low alcohol because alcohol makes you drunk and also tired sugar sugar makes you feeling good and uh, feeling uh, happy but not too much because uh, too much sugar makes also you tired and um, and acidity refreshes you. So the cabinet was the best wine for <laughs> drinking in the vineyard. Uh, but also uh, yes. drinking as a cabinet, you can drink every uh, the whole day. Yes. As, as, as Dirk said, when you're going to a lunch with your wife and your wife having, having a, a headache, the Magnum is the perfect bottle for you. <laughs> I love it. A Magnum at lunch. With that balance, yes. So we did have a question here, just talking about how German producers could communicate to the US more clearly their farming practices so that Americans realize how eco-centered you are in terms of this approach. because almost, I would, I would say close to 8% of all production is organic and beyond in Germany. And that may not seem like a huge amount, but that is compared to some other countries. So how could you more clearly tell our consumers about your detailed environment focused farming? Um, may I? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, go for it, Sophie. Um, like, um, I think, um, like the easiest thing, for example, is to check, like the first thing you can check are the, the labels on the back of the, the bottle. Um, because like if binaries are certified, you'll always find, um, the labels on the back. Um, yeah, we have the organic and the biodynamic certification on our back label, but I think another great way is, um, Instagram, for example, because on social media, it's so easy to show everyone what you're doing in the vineyards and what you're working on. I think that's something that many of us do in a great way. And I love taking people to the vineyards with me on Instagram. Um, and that's something that is a, an easy way, I'd say. Who else would like to chime in? It's, it's uh, one, 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 uh, one thing I want to say. It, it, I think it's not, you have not to see everything dogmatic that one is good or extremely good and one is bad. I think the, the future have to be, have to be bioelectric or biodynamic in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, but it's not that easy to uh, do it just, just tomorrow. And uh, I think it's coming more and more. And then, as I said, see uh, Sophie's wine on the back label, you see, the, the logo uh, from the biologic uh, certification that hopefully come in the future for everybody. Yes, I think Americans, if they saw that logo, if they were able to see it, it would probably register pretty quickly. But many Americans are not aware of biodynamics even. You know, they will recognize for sure organic 
But I think that that ability to put that on the back label is very helpful in, in clarifying the message. Katarina, did you have anything to add? Well, I totally agree with uh, Sophie. Um, of course, the first first look would be at the label that shows the certification, but for a winery that is not certified yet, just as we are, we, we have to trust in the interest of the customer and that they inform it themselves. And a good way is Instagram, where you can take the people in the vineyard, in your cellar, and show them the way of production and take them to your estate because every estate is so... Um, yeah, by its own that yeah, it's just great to to go with them and let that you flow in it. Wonderful. I'm just looking at our timeline here. I think um, are there any questions that we're missing? Let's see here. Um, I see one coming in right now, and it's stating that the younger drinking generation around the world is really concerned about the land and the chemical use. So there's a stigma, even if not fair, surrounding German wines in general, that the perceived high use of sulfur and pesticides is kind of linked in this. And as you mentioned, um, you can cut and paste the same approach to each winemaker. It doesn't necessarily work that way. You have to find your own path. So is there, any kind of collective effort to tell a different story region to region? That's a pretty serious question. Or is it about Germany having one unified message? What do you think? I, I think in general, um, the first thing you can see is like, we are all very aware of that topic. Like if you hear all of us talking, like everyone faces different conditions, but everyone's thinking about how to face it. Because I think we are all aware of the fact that wine growing is a pretty intense culture. And um, since like everyone knows grapes, grapes are very sensitive fruit. And so it's not that easy, especially in Germany, where like even if we are complaining about drought, um, it's still rather one of the red wine growing regions. So it's not as easy for us as for the wine growers in Spain or France, for example. Um, so I think the, the main approach and the main message is that um, young wine growers in every region are thinking about the topic and everyone is trying to change the thing that he can change easily. But um, it's also important to explain to the customers that there are some things that are so complicated to change that it's not necessarily making sense to focus on like certain things all the time. Excellent. That's a great point. And I think it is right on spot. I see one other question here for the women. And I hate to call Philip the token male on the panel here, but um, for the women, as women, do you experience any stuffiness in the German wine community in regards to women in wine? Or is that mostly gone now? Katarina? Well, since I'm not the winemaker itself, uh, actually I'm more in charge for the sales. Um, I guess I can give a good overview, but um, when I started my studies in Geisenheim, there were a lot of women and um, it hasn't been a problem. Sophie, maybe you can tell I, me I think I think in general, it's okay, especially if you work with young people, like with the older generation, like we were, like we went out to buy, um, I went out to buy a new um, tractor with the um, young man that is um, yeah, in charge of our vineyards. And of course, the, pe the people that were selling the tractor wouldn't talk to me just until they noticed that I would be the one paying for the tractor. <laughs> and it was really funny because he just couldn't get it. Like he was like, 55 or something and he just couldn't believe that I'd be the person buying the tractor and not the man coming there with me so like no one's really unfriendly but um, people sometimes tend to be surprised that um, yeah that the woman can be serious about making wine and serious about not only 
doing sales, but also working in the vineyards and working in the cellar and everything. But I think in general, um, especially young people are pretty easy to accept the fact. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there are a lot of famous women winemakers that's why it's getting more and more in the brains of the people uh, such as Teresa Breuer for example but it needs time especially talking about older generations and uh, to see that it's even possible for us great now I saw one fast question here Sophie there was a question on how you achieve 11 and a half percent alcohol in this dry style it's a you know it's pretty un much an anomaly a lot of times, especially in the warmer areas. Can you touch on that just real quickly? Um, I think in general, um, biodynamics slowed down the sugar ripening process in our grapes. That's something that we've um, yeah, noticed in the, the past five or six years since it, since it become like a normal thing for our vineyards since they got used to it. Um, and so what we see, like one, I think one thing is um, earlier picking because um, I think like five or eight years ago, um, we tended to pick our grapes a little bit overripe. So that's one part. And the other part is really slow sugar ripening while normal aromatic ripeness is achieved. And so we tend to have lower sugar levels in ripe grapes than other wine growers in the area. Thank you. That was very succinct. Well, I know we're right here at the one hour mark. Um, Stephen, would you like to come on and let us know if there's anything we're missing here? Yes, I'm here, um, turning on my video. Um, I think we've answered sort of most of the questions today um, from the from the Q and A and from and from the panel. But um, I think we wanted to to bring sort of this type of programming to life here because you know I think. There's so much hunger for, and so much love, frankly, for German Riesling. And, you know, as sort of wines of Germany here in the US, time and time again, we see excitement, passion, love for all three of these very different, but um, very, I'm, I'm, I was loving the tasting, um, you know, very sort of opinionated wines, if you know, very specific styles of wine. And I think we see that a lot in the, trade community and the sommelier community in the media, um, you know, people who work in wine. Um, but the challenge has always been, how do you tell the story of Riesling to a consumer whose very first wine ever was some inexpensive, overly sweet style of Riesling? And so I think, you know, before we end, I, that's the question that I'd like to pose to the three of you, because to me, as you know, as someone who works in the U.S. market, it is the thing that we get asked a lot, and it's frankly the biggest challenge because I taste all three of these wines today. All three are incredible for completely different reasons. They're so different, and what I'd love to sort of hear from the three of you is how do you communicate um, the beauty and magic of Riesling to a general consumer audience? And I don't know if anyone wants to take that first. <laughs> well, uh, maybe I should start as the wine growing region that is dominated by Riesling, as no, no um, wine growing region in Germany is. is. And um, for us, or for me, um, Riesling is everything. Um, I mean, we plant 80% Riesling here, and it's the grape variety um, that you can produce almost everything you need out. So you can make a basic wine, easy drinking wine, as we just had the safe water drink Riesling. You can produce high quality wine, such as Christmann does it a lot, the GGs. You can uh, produce a uh, sparkling wine as well. You can produce perfectly um, sweet wines, such as the one we had from Philip. Um, so for me, Riesling is um, yeah, a great variety that is so, variable and um, so you can produce it in so many different ways that it's just yeah I don't have to say anything more and people who visit the Ranga region often ask don't you want to grow any other grape varieties such as Cow Burgunder or Pinot Gris or um, I don't know Sauvignon Blanc but uh, for me Riesling is just everything you need and that's how I try to explain it to others. 
We could even give him one of Philip's pew pew pet nap Rieslings. <laughs> Pretty much shock him right there. We didn't go into the natural wine, but Philip, the Theo brand is more natural oriented. So I think that's a fun twist is to shock people into something they have no idea of what to expect. Pet nap, Riesling, Spaper Gunder. We didn't talk about that, obviously not today, but yes, had to get uh, that out there. Yes, as I said in the, in the beginning, we do, we do in the Mosul with the unconventional uh, wines. Um, and ones are the, the our orange line and uh, our pet nut line, um, which we really love. Uh, we 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 start. Um, we like to doing wines in the field brand, where we worked uh, with other vintners and um, or where we visiting vintners or talking about with vintners, and uh, then we getting ideas um, to doing. It on our way, in our style, at our region, uh, as uh, the pet nut, which we drink the first one, I don't know, 10 years ago or 11. And then we started in 2010 to do a pet nut. Uh, and we, yeah, we, we bottled in, we, we liked that wine so much that we bottled uh, the 2011, the first, 2010 or 11, the first wine like 4,000 bottles, and then we leave the bottles uh, till 2017 uh, in in our warehouse because we we like to wait uh, how how the the, the wine uh, aging and like that stuff um, before we bringing wines on the market in in a bit uh, natural way. We do a couple years uh, tests, making that wine, uh, tested it, and then when we finding our way and like uh, our style, then we bring it on the market. That is one of I, our. I think it's great. I think it just speaks to Riesling and how different, like Katarina said, the face, the persona is, and I think trying to explain that to consumers so they don't stereotypically define Riesling, that's our quest, is to show them this broad variation, shock them so they don't forget. They have, Riesling has so many faces. Uh, we bring now, uh, before Christmas, our floor uh, on the market, which uh, a wine which is made like a sherry, uh, but not, uh, not fortified. Uh, and it tastes totally like in the uh, Jerez. And it's so amazing which, which what you can do with a, just a Riesling. I love it. Wonderful. Well, if there are no more questions, um, I think we're going to conclude today on that note that the many faces of Riesling are just incredible. And these were three fantastic wines to kind of side by side today. So. Um, on behalf of Wines of Germany, uh, Philip, Katarina, Sophie, and Vora, thank you all so much for this tasting. It was a lot of fun to, to put together and even more fun um, to watch alongside you. Um, before, we, before we leave, just to remind our, our attendees, we do have um, four more events in the series. So we are the next event is um, the, our Vino Vinyasa event, and it's all about the super women of sect. So three fantastic uh, sects produced by three amazing women. Um, we'll be joined uh, by Morgan Perry, the host and founder of Vina Vinyasa and the new current German wine queen as of something like two or three weeks ago, um, Eva Lanzarath. Um, so um, really excited to um, have a bunch of sect on Friday and another great breakfast wine and um, hope that y'all can join us for that. Um, thank you all so much. And if you have any questions or any follow up, feel free to get in touch with the Wines of Germany team. We'll make sure that you to direct you in the right place. Thank you all. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye.